How are we doing this evening? Yeah, it's good, right? You know, there's a little correlation that I made there. We, um, Chris shared a scripture from, for the song over Cain, right? And what did he say? He said that the enemy goes before the throne as an accuser of the brethren. How often? He said, day and night. And then we sang house of prayer, Lord, make me a house, make me a house of prayer. And what did we say? Day and night, night and day, day and night, night and day, make me a house of prayer. Why do we need to be a house of prayer day and night? Because the enemy, is our accuser of the brethren, is standing before the throne day and night, night and day, accusing. So what should we be doing day and night, night and day? We should be praying, right? I love when God connects the dots like that. That's exciting stuff. So. For this evening, um, I felt like we didn't get the fullness of what was to be um, studied and learned and lived out or um, kind of like squeezed out of the uh, new wineskin message last week. And so we're going to continue uh, in that while we're also going to look at some new things like thought patterns and mindsets and how God wants to heal us of those things. Um, the things which keep us from being made new, okay? It's one thing to hear a message about becoming a new wineskin or the, the necessity of being a new wineskin, and then it's something else altogether um, to know how we actually do that, right? And so um, I had mentioned last week that with the new year uh, upon us that we often hear of God doing a new thing. Everybody pulls out the scripture, right? But I gave a challenge in asking the question, what if God, instead of doing a new thing like outer, peripheral, out on the horizon is doing a new thing, what if we reconsidered that whole idea and that whole scripture to God is making his people new so that they can represent him in a new era, amen? Yeah, and so what if that new thing he's doing is actually a new work within us, all right? And I don't know if any of you have felt that so far yet, just in these first 12 days of the new year, that God is doing something within you and stirring something within you, and that he's speaking to his people um, maybe more than he has been, like it's becoming more frequent, okay? Or we're just more in tune, one or the other, okay? But what if that new thing is a new work that is in us, okay? A further surrendering, a refining, okay, that happens. Um, him further calling us and equipping us as we further surrender to him. And would we be okay with that if that is the case, all right? So what if it's not just about new wine, all right? Everybody wants the new wine. What if it's not just about the new wine? What if it's about us being made into new wineskins? Because new wine can't be placed in old wineskins, as that scripture told us, right? So we're going to look at that scripture again this week, found in Luke chapter 5, verse 37 through 39. It says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Verse 39, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. Now, if we know that we're vessels to be used by Almighty God, all right, then we must know that we need to be made into new wineskins, okay? And we need to be made um, into these in order to be able to house all that it is that God has for us, okay, to be poured into us and to be an outflow from us. So basically, we need to be made new, right? And that's good because guess what? God is in the business of what? See, I make all things new, right? And so in order to have newness housed within us, we need to be made new ourselves, and we become new wineskins um, so that that can happen. And so this is exciting stuff, all right? I pray that um, there's just as much of an excitement and an anticipation inside of you, all right, inside of your spirit as what you felt if you were here last week, all right? If you weren't here last week, you don't have a measuring stick for that, and that's okay, <laughs> all right? But um, actually, even more so this week, I hope that there is this feeling of, of anticipation within you, this feeling of... Um, 
on the brinkness. I don't know if that's a word. Okay, but this excitement that um, bubbles up from inside of you. And last week I had talked to you guys about like the tears that would immediately come because of um, the weight of the anointing that was on the word that I was to give. And I knew the responsibility of that fact. And tonight there's more of an excitement, okay, and like a rising level of anticipation that's within me instead. And so that makes me really excited for each of you that are open to receiving what it is that God has for you this evening, because I know this level of anticipation and excitement, it's not for me, okay? It's for all of you, and it's for what God has, um, is anticipating and doing in your life. Wow. And so, yeah, so Ashley at least is excited, and I hope that it's contagious and just sweeps across the whole rest of the sanctuary, amen. So <laughs> this message is timely, okay? Um, and it's for each of you under the sound of my voice, but God is much bigger than to just leave it at that. Okay, God is much bigger than just, this is a message for January 12th, and next week there will be another one, and Sunday there will be another one, and that was great, and let's go home. God's so much bigger than that, and these things should build upon each other. The level of expectancy within us should build and increase as we move along, okay? But there's also a furthering of the word that's going to be um, an ongoing refining work that is going to happen. And I, I really felt that God spoke this to me this afternoon as I was writing this, that he said, this isn't just, it's not just about right now. And it's not just about these ones that are seated here or these ones that are listening in, but there's a furthering of the word that's going to go on. And it's going to be this ongoing refining process, okay, that's going to happen in each heart. But it's only going to happen in each heart that postures itself in surrender before the Father, okay? And so if we are not willing to be in that posture, if we are not willing to surrender ourselves before him, if we're not willing to lay it all out before him, then this will just be another message, and this will just be another time where you gather together, okay? But it's not going to be just for you also. It's going to be for those that... Um, as you take it out to others, it's going to be for those that you share it with as well, okay? And so it's either going to be by the difference that they see in your life. I mean, how many of us are around like pretty much the same people all the time, okay? They ought to be able to see a difference in us as these things are refined in our lives, okay? But it's also going to result in a further measure of the anointing that is going to be housed by you, and so if you really grasp this, and if you really reach out for this, and if you really surrender yourself before him, you're going to have that capacity uh, to be able to house a greater level of his anointing, okay? And um, it might be very practically, and just the thought that um, out of these doors, you're going to be able to share this message with others. You're going to be able to basically like regurgitate what it was that you had heard, and you're going to be able to share it with somebody that you come in contact with, okay? Um, you might be able to give the basics of it to somebody coming up um, along behind you in the word, okay, or in these things of God. And if we remember Pastor Steve's message from Sunday morning, he said we should always be a, have a hand that's reaching up, right? We should always have someone in our life that that knows more than us, that we look up to, that we're constantly gleaning from, or that we can catch something from, you know, somebody that that maybe um, challenges our thinking a little bit in the things of God, or makes us dig into the scripture a little more than what we would have normally, and then at the same time, we should always have a hand that's reaching down, right? We should always have a hand that is um, reaching to one who's coming up along beside us, okay? I'm not making this like a levels thing, all right? I'm just saying there are ones that are more studious than I am, okay? There are ones who hear from God, and I glean from them, and I'm like, that was good, right? And then there's other ones who text me during the day and go, I'm reading my devotions, and I don't know what this word means, or what does this mean about God, or can you tell me this? And I'm going, yeah, yeah. I want you to have questions because it means you're learning and it means you want to learn, right? And so, um, so that two-way thing, you know, that we are like that middle person. And so we need to remember those things, okay? That's what I'm talking about right now is that this word and what God is desiring to accomplish through it is for you to be increased in capacity yourself for being a carrier of his anointing, but also to be able to share it with, um, to share what is being presented to you 
with others around you, okay? And so, um, I don't know, I hope you guys are excited, but um, yes, thank you. <laughs> but whenever God wants to create, okay, a new wineskin, he is going to confront things in order to transform things, all right? So I want us to think of that. God confronts things in order to transform things. And this is the part that we don't like. This is the part that's uncomfortable. This is the part that he either deals with us on a personal level, which I like if he does it that way because it's a little more private, okay? But if he can't get our attention in that way, then sometimes it has to come more um, collectively or publicly, all right? But any time that we want to really experience transformation in the spirit, all right, then if we want to be transformed more into the image of Christ, and I pray that's always our desire, all right, then the Lord in his perfect love, not the Lord in anger, not the Lord in wrath, but the Lord in his perfect love will confront those things in our life so that we can change, okay? And so... It's the whole essence, and we're not going to get into it, but it's the whole essence of the beginning parts of Hebrews chapter 12, you know, that he corrects or he chastens those that he loves, all right? Have you, um, it goes on in the scripture to say, you know, have you ever met a father who didn't correct their children, and what kind of love would there be if somebody didn't correct one that is their own, and all of these kind of things? So we have to know that it's God in his love that does this for us. You know, I've mentioned many times, you know, if my son Isaac was out getting ready to run into the road and play into traffic, what would I do? I would yell. I would get his attention. I would maybe snatch him by the back of the neck if I was close enough, not in wrath or anger, but what? In protection and in love because I want what's best for him. And so that's what happens is anything that needs to be transformed in our lives first needs to be confronted by the Lord to even make us aware because guess what? We don't like to see those things on our own. How many of us just go, okay, let me just think of all the things that, are, that need worked on in me. We don't do that. You know, if we do, I, I don't know, you're a different sort of character than <laughs> most that I know, okay? But this ongoing refining work, okay, that I mentioned a moment ago, or this confronting, okay, this is that refining work. And it might happen just through reading scripture, there's been times in my life where I needed a refining work of the Lord to happen in my life. And I was sitting, reading scripture, all right? My life wasn't what it should be, but I still knew enough to sit and read scripture. And as I read scripture, I saw descriptions of my life that were written about in there that you wouldn't want your life to line up with, that you wouldn't want it to be going, oh, I feel like I'm looking in a mirror right now, okay? And it was a very... Um, heavy wake-up call for me, okay? Now, what was that? That was God wanting transformation to happen in my life, and so he was throw showing me through his scripture something that needed confronted or something that needed worked on in my life. Why did he do that? Because he was angry at me and full of wrath? No, because he loves me, because he knew what it was that my life in his will was going to end up as, and he knew that as long as my life was lining up with these scriptures I was reading, I was never going to get to there, okay? And so this confronting or this refining work, it can happen through the reading of scripture. It can happen through the preached word behind the pulpit. Have we ever been sitting uh, in service and something just pricks us, something that's said, okay? Um, that's the Holy Spirit at work in your life, okay? It has nothing to do with shame. It has nothing to do with any of that, but it has to do with God saying, okay, this is the thing we're going to work on now. We've mastered this over here. You've done so well with this. Now we're moving on to this. Do we remember the thing about the layers? I don't have time to get into all of that. But he works on us in layers, right? And so it can happen through the preached word, or it can even happen um, with him dealing with our heart either just in, in the moment, okay, in the moment of us doing or thinking the thing that needs worked on, okay? Or it might just be this other random time where it was like, wow, God, where'd that come from? I wasn't even planning on us doing any work on me today, you know? But God had something to speak or to, to put his finger on right there, okay? So we see that if something is never actually confronted, then it'll always stay the same, okay? And it can't both stay the same and be made new, 
We can't stay the same as what we've always been and be made new. Those two things are contradictory to each other. And so there are times that God is working in us, okay, and dealing with us, and that he'll confront things that are in us, and he'll confront mindsets, and he'll confront um, strongholds, and he'll confront false belief systems, or he'll confront sinful behaviors that are in our life, or he'll confront... Um, negative thought patterns that we might have, like a victimization or a victimhood that we might be living under, okay? Um, The lies of the enemy that we've been beguiled or charmed into believing, okay? And he'll confront these things because he loves us and also in order for us to change, for that transformation to take place, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So part of becoming a new line skin is letting go of the old, right? And letting God make all things new. He's not going to make all things new against our will. He's not going to make all things new with us kicking and screaming and his, him dragging us along. And that's why I mentioned earlier that our hearts have to be postured in surrender before him in order for this work to even begin to happen because he's not going to do it against our will, okay? And so the more we allow God to do this process in us or this refining in us, the more we become this new wineskin, all right? Now, remember, we touched last week on that verse 39, okay, and how it speaks of wanting to hold on to the old, right? And um, not even having a desire for the new. It says those that drink the old wine don't even desire the new wine. All right. And so we touched on the I remember when of like our Christian experiences and and maybe our most um, definitive in our mind, like our most standout moments that we've had with God, whether it was either feeling the Holy Spirit and feeling his presence on us or maybe a time when he spoke through us or really moved in someone else's life and and used us as a vessel to do things or whatever it was and how remember we talked about how we could make that like the ultimate end all experience of our Christian walk and and we would just spend the rest of our lives trying to circle back and get to that place again remember and so if we use that as the measuring stick but it's important to note that that old that we might not desire the new things because we're stuck in the old. Last week, we talked about those old things still being good things, right? We talked about the tent revivals of the day and all these kind of things, all right? And so as we think of God moving us into a new era, okay, and being prepared and being the people that we need to be to be um, used of him and to be vessels of him in this new era, Yes, there was a time for us to compare those things, of the good things, okay, of the oh my goodness, wow moments in our Christian walk. But sometimes that old that we might have trouble letting go of, okay, um, might not even be the good things that have happened in our life. They might not even be those marked moments where Holy Spirit was just all over us, okay? And It can sometimes even be the negative things that have happened in our lives, okay? The things that we have become so familiar with, and we can become familiar with the negative, can't we? Yeah, we can become familiar with the negative. We can become familiar with depression. We can become familiar with self-pity. We can become familiar with a victim mentality. We can become familiar with fear and anxiety, right? especially over the course of these last 22 months, people that never dealt with anxiety before, people that were never riddled with uh, fear before and are now, okay? And so we can become familiar with those things, and it is possible to become familiar with them in a sense that you then become begin to, like, settle down in them. You begin to, like, make yourself comfortable in them almost, yeah, or become complacent against battling your way out of them, right? And so um, there's this little phrase that my bestie Erica shared in a sermon one time, and she had said, don't become comfortable in your dysfunction. And I went, whoa, how many times do we get comfortable in our dysfunction? You know, and have we ever, like, maybe we think our family has it all together, you know, but did you ever spend like more time with anybody than what you normally do? And you begin to see things you didn't really notice before. And you're like, oh, their family dynamic's a little different than I thought. 
or, oh, you can tell who wears the pants in that family, or, I mean, just anything. I mean, it can be anything, you know, oh, the kids rule the roost there, or, oh, I never realized they were that spoiled, or <laughs> these are all negative things I'm <laughs> popping out at you guys, by the way, but have we ever gotten, like, closer to someone than what we've always been, and we begin to see things in, like, a different light than we had before? This whole crowd over here is giggling. I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe they just all started hanging out with each other. I don't know. <laughs> but guess what? We become comfortable in our own dysfunctions, and we don't see them as dysfunctions anymore. I explained to people what my childhood was growing up, and guess what? It was just my childhood growing up. To me, it was just life. Now, when I explain it to somebody, I'm like, we were like a high-functioning, dysfunctional family. <laughs> like... Who does that? Who, you know, my mom and dad were married, but they lived in two different states, and we would visit each other on the weekends, and like, you know, it wasn't like a custody thing. It was like my mom and dad visited each other on the weekends. It, like, that's weird, you know? And like, how many people live that way? But to me, that's just how I grew up, you know? And now I can look on it and go, yeah, that was strange, but that's that's just how life was, you know? But I was comfortable in the dysfunctionality, that's dysfunctional, just so y'all know. Like, <laughs> I was comfortable in the dysfunctionality of all that because it's all I knew, right? And so we become comfortable in our dysfunction either because we don't know any better and that's just life or because we don't want to confront the dysfunction because that takes work and it takes effort and it makes us laying down our prideful thoughts of, no, look, I look like I have it all together, and if I start to let God confront these things in my life, I might not look like I have it all together for a while while he deals with me or, or while I'm at the altar or while I'm crying in my seat or while I'm a little less active on social media or while whatever, right? And so um, it's not that we want those things in our life. It's not even... Maybe there's been horrible, traumatic things that have happened in our lives. It's not that we asked for those things to happen, okay? But there's a part of us that doesn't know any different. And so we just stay in it then because we don't know any better. But God has something better for us, right? And so we have to know that. And in order to receive that better that he has for us, I mean, how many of us, no matter how wonderful life is, how many of us could say, oh, yeah, I'd like better, right? Yeah, get, get, Jesus at least once, but he'll take your better too if you don't want it because, right? But God has something better for us. And in order for us to receive that better that he has for us, we need made into new wineskins, okay? But in order to be made into new wineskins, we have to let go of all that we hold on to. And we hold on to a lot of things. A lot of times, guess what we are? We're great holders of our pain, okay? And we hold tightly to our pain, and we become very familiar with it, and we become very comfortable around it, and sometimes we even parade it around, okay, and, and even make a spectacle of it for others to see, and maybe we don't even realize that we do that, but, but we do. And then what else do we hold on to? Sometimes we hold on to sickness, and sometimes we've just been sick for so long or we've had a disability for so long that it's just become so much a part of us that, that we just become comfortable in it. And so then we might hold on to it and hold tightly to it or we might have just become familiar with it. Or sometimes, guess what? There's ones that parade it around for others to see, not even intentionally most of the time, but it's just become so wrapped up in their identity. And... Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Char. Where are you? I saw you earlier. Oh, there you are. Oh, she sat in a different seat. Look, I looked in the wrong spot. That was funny. Um, <laughs> I saw her share something on the Mercy Family page in a comment. And somebody had called it my something. I, I believe it was cancer, but it might not have been. It might have been something else. But they were like, please pray with me as I continue to battle with my cancer, we're just going to say. And she lovingly commented, that is not your cancer, <laughs> and it needs to go back to the pit of hell where it came from, and da 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 like, it was good, okay? And I so agree with that, and I have um, mentioned that lovingly to many people before, like, please do not grab a hold of that and, and take, um, 
draw your identity from it and, and all of those kind of things. That's not yours. That's not what God has for you. That's not the better, okay, that he has in your life, okay? And so don't get stuck in this thing, well, well, this is just my lot that I'm supposed to suffer through, and I'll be able to witness for God in the midst of it. Yeah, you can, but also don't give up and become comfortable in it to where you're not always seeking for a healing of those things, okay? And I'm not saying that we're never to get sick and all those kind of things. This isn't a big doctrinal issue I'm going to get into, but I'm going to say it's not yours, okay? So don't take it on as yourself and don't identify it with in with it um, in those ways, okay? And so we can do that. We can become great holders of our pain or even sickness or ailments that we have, and then we become protectors of those, we become protectors of our pain, okay? And we don't let other people into them. And we kind of put up a fence or a wall around them. And how does something ever get dealt with if it has a fence or a wall built around it, right? And so we become protectors of it. But holding our pain and our hurts and our victimizations and our sicknesses is not the way to becoming a new wineskin, okay? And you see it's all of these negative things, these areas of brokenness that are in our life, okay? These negative thought processes that we might have, um, these wrongful patterns or even these sinful habits that might be in our lives. These things become cracks in the wineskin. And so remember what we talked about old wineskins. Why can't old wineskins have new wine put into them? It's because they've already been stretched to their capacity. And when fermentation happens and they try to expand, they're going to crack and they're going to break, right? So God can't pour more into us when we're cracked and we're parched and we're dried out because it's just going to leak out everywhere because we don't have the capacity to house those things, okay? So God can pour that new wine in, but if it's not into a fresh wineskin, then these cracks are going to happen, okay? And so then we have to talk about, well, then how is a wineskin made new? I'm glad you asked because this is really good, okay? A wineskin is made new, ah, listen to this, by rubbing oil onto the wineskin. Hallelujah. So it's not that you discard the old wineskin. It's not that you throw it away and you go buy new. I mean, if we know anything about the culture of this day, when Jesus is speaking these things to the people, there, there was not a lot of waste that happened. They used everything, okay? Well, it didn't mean that once a wineskin was used once, it could never be used again. No, it just meant that it had been stretched and it had been dried and it was cracked and these things happened and, and it needed made new. And the way to be made new is someone had to rub oil on it. And if we think and let that soak in for a minute, okay, that a wineskin is made new by rubbing oil into or onto the wineskin, then this process of this wineskin being made new then it begins to become more flexible. And then it begins to become more pliable. And then it has the capacity to hold what is being poured into it, right? And so remember last week when we talked about how wine was poured into the wineskins before it was fully fermented, and so then um, it needed to have the ability to allow for that expansion that would take place when the fermentation happened. Oh, think of that. Because not only does God want to pour new wine in, right? But he will also anoint us with the Holy Spirit to take those hardened areas of life. And to take those dried up areas of our lives. Okay? And to rub the oil of his anointing and of his spirit and of his presence. And he'll rub them in. Okay? So that we don't crack and we don't break and we don't leak okay, the anointing out when he begins to pour it onto us and pour it into us. And so I want us to think of dehydration for a minute. Think of any of us that have been dehydrated, okay? Think of anyone, even just in the case of like, have you ever had really bad chapped lips? Okay, I was thinking of that earlier today. Like, have you ever had your lips so chapped that like, if you smiled too big, they were going to crack because they were really bad? Or if we've ever dealt with really dry skin, you know, I can remember my dad's skin would be so dry on his fingers that sometimes he would just get these deep cracks 
in his thumbs that would just be very, very painful to him. And it's just because they were so dried out. And then if we think of ourselves, okay, if we think of our spirit as a wineskin, and if we think of it being old and being used and being dried out and being cracked and, and how those things, they can what? They can become very painful, okay? And they can cause deep wounds in us and they can cause us to, to bleed even, all right? Now think of that in terms of then God wanting us made into new wineskins. It's not just so that he can use us. It's also for our own healing. Think of the oil of gladness. That's for ourselves, right? Think of his presence and basking in his presence. That doesn't do anything for anybody else. If I'm sitting or standing during worship, basking in the presence of God, that's not affecting any of the rest of you. But that's for me. And in that moment, that's okay. In the moment, that's where we soak that in, right? In the moment, that's where he's rubbing that oil into that dried, parched, wineskin and making it new again all right and so if we think of God anointing us with the oil of his presence to heal us and to restore us and to make us brand new and to make the wineskin new so that we can then hold or have the capacity to hold what it is that he's pouring into our lives and for that to not leak out because the thing is remember from last week we don't want to just leak right we don't want to have a leak. We want to overflow. And if you're leaking, you can never be filled up to full capacity to where you're going to overflow. Okay? And if you're not leaking, then when God begins to pour these things into you, eventually you're going to become completely full, right? Completely filled. And then it starts pouring out or it starts overflowing out of the top, right? Yeah. Being in the overflow. And that's where the overflow of the anointing comes in our lives and lives are changed in the overflow okay lives are changed in the old overflow souls come to christ in the overflow and hearts are softened in the overflow and walls and and fences are torn down in the overflow and chains are broken in the overflow and lives are surrendered in the overflow. And relationships with each other are mended in the overflow. And sickness is eradicated in the overflow. And vacancies in hell are created in the overflow. And the kingdom of God is expanded in the overflow. And how many other things could we list? There is joy in the overflow. And there are miracles in the overflow. And there is an expansion of the kingdom of God in the overflow. But that overflow of the anointing of God can't happen if we're not new wineskins yet. And that anointing and that overflow can't happen if we're cracked and we're leaking everywhere that we go. And that overflow of that anointing can't be used in our own lives if we haven't postured ourselves and surrender before God and say go ahead pinpoint it go ahead draw attention to it go ahead show me in scripture what it is that I need to work on go ahead and confront these things in my life because if they don't look like you I don't want them in my life anyway because my greatest desire is to look more and be made more conformable into the image of your son and that's not going to happen if I'm an old wineskin I can only look like Jesus Christ if I'm a new wineskin. I can only look like Jesus Christ if the oil of his presence has been rubbed onto and rubbed into me. And those things can only happen if I allow them to happen. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. But if we... Amen. Amen. <laughs> Giggle on, girl. Um, but if we don't allow God to work in us, okay, then this anointing and this overflow can never actually flow out of us. And if we don't allow God to work in us then and to heal us and to set us free from trauma, okay, or to set us free from offense or to set us free from bitterness and from anger, to set us free from resentment and hurts and, and the stuff that we could just carry around with us for years, couldn't we? And then we justify it because, well, you don't know what happened or you weren't there or, but I deserve or I have a right to feel this way. 
Yeah, you do. If you want to be an old wineskin the rest of your life, you have every right to feel that way. Yes, that was wrong what happened to you. Yes, that was dysfunctional what you grew up in. Yes, that boy was wrong to put his hands on you when you said no. Yes, these things shouldn't have happened in your life. Yes, you shouldn't have been taken advantage like that. Yes, that man had no right to touch you that way. Yeah, that woman broke your heart when she went off with someone else. Yes, all these things happened. Yes. They did. I'm not denying that they did. I'm not denying the pain that's associated with it. I'm not denying the ways that you've tried to self-medicate and get yourself through those times since they happened. But we do not have to identify with the traumas that have happened to us. And we do not have to hold on to them and call them our own and become familiar with them and settle down into them like that's where we're supposed to be planted. That does not have to define our life. And even, yes, amen, and even if those have been the things that have happened, and even if those have been the things that we have lived out from, and that's been our perspective on life, and that's been the lens that we have viewed things from, it doesn't have to remain that way. And so God, in his great love, can bring you through those times, and he can confront those things in your life. There is something that a friend of mine decided to share with me about a week and a half ago. And I've never had anything like it happen before. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. She just wanted prayer. But as she described details of this traumatic event, instantly I was taken back to a place where I try never to go in my mind. And instantly I could relate. And instantly, I could call back feelings and emotions. And instantly, there was pain that came up within me. And these are things that I've dealt with already with God. And these are things that I've already prayed over. And these are things that I've already forgiven others of. And these are things that even though the person that did them to me is in a grave somewhere now, they still have uh, come to the surface at different times. And I've dealt with them in the things of God. And I've dealt with them according to Scripture. And I've asked God to to take the pain away from those things. And so then you go along for a really long time without it even entering your mind, right? And then all of a sudden, boom, I'm right there again. Instantly, in my mind, everything I see around me isn't the room that I'm sitting in at the time. It's where I was when these things happened. And I'm going, oh my God, where did this come from? I thought we were done with this. And so as I'm ministering to this other person... And as I'm praying over them, and as I'm thanking God that they saw something in me that had them open up to me in these things, at the same time, guess what? I'm reeling inside. And I'm going, wow, I thought this was done. I thought this was over. I thought that was buried and gone decades ago. And it's still there. It's not there in the way that it had been. Yeah, parts and pieces of it had been healed. Yes, it was less traumatic than when it actually occurred. But guess what? There was still some rubbing of the oil that needed to happen in my life. And so it's not just being in his presence during praise and worship that the oil gets rubbed into our lives. And it's not just when we walk into the house of God and when we're surrounded by our brothers and sisters in Christ, although these are all important things. Sometimes it's sitting in the middle of an office somewhere while somebody pours out their heart to you and you realize that you still have some things within you that need healed from God. And guess what he does? If you allow him, he'll rub that oil in a little more. And he'll allow those things to be healed a little more in your life. And I'm not saying I'm never going to think of it again. And I'm not saying that when a certain date rolls around on the calendar again, those things aren't all the way, you know, as soon as my eyes pop in the morning. But I'm saying that healing happens. And healing happens in stages, okay? But healing doesn't happen if we remain comfortable in our dysfunction. And healing doesn't happen if we don't posture ourselves and surrender before our God. And our wineskins don't become new if we just want to sit here in our pain and protect it and say, but I have a right to feel this way. Amen? Yeah. 
if we don't allow God to work these things out in us, then we can never be used as a house for the overflow of the anointing that is going to be instrumental in the lives of others. So this isn't just about you. It's about the lives of others that your life is going to touch. Mercy Music can come back up to the front if you want. If you can. (laughs) But it's about, what did I say? If I had stayed here as I was reading that scripture that my life lined up with that it shouldn't have, I would have never got to the places where God needed to use me in the lives of others. And so we have to think of that. I'm nothing special because I stand up here. Pastor Steve, Pastor Jerry, we're just fulfilling a calling that God has placed on our lives. But there's a calling on each and every one of your lives. And there are people in your sphere of influence that I am never going to meet and never be able to talk and speak life into and speak truth into. But God has placed you in those areas. And so do you want to be dried and parched in an old wineskin as you're placed in that sphere? Or do you want now to posture yourselves before God and surrender so that he can begin to rub that oil into the dry 